it's uh, lovely to sing that hymn there um, because it is sweet to trust in Jesus. And uh, funnily enough, uh, this morning, uh, that's a little bit about what I want to talk about, really, and just what it is to actually trust the Lord Jesus and trust him in our lives every day, uh, in everything we do. Um, uh, at Brownwood recently, we've been uh, studying Mark. We've been looking at Mark's gospel and slowly going through it. Uh, and uh, for me, it's been a real help to do that um, because uh, Mark's gospel is quite a simple gospel, I think. <laughs> I'm quite a simple person. And uh, I, I found it very helpful and encouraging and, and just to get a sense really of how busy the life the Lord Jesus was, you know, it was non-stop. Uh, and you really get that sense when you read through the Gospel of Mark. You, you see how the Lord just went from one thing to another and almost didn't have time to stop. It says at times him and his disciples didn't have time to eat. And you know, if you're truly going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, then it will disrupt your life. It will affect your life. Uh, when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, your life is not really your own anymore. And uh, we, we, I guess, uh, need to be willing, really, uh, to let God do what he wants to do in our lives. And, and, and there'll be a cost in that. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, looking through Mark's gospel, uh, you just get a real sense of uh, how the, the life of the Lord was, but also his disciples uh, when they chose to follow the Lord Jesus. And um, just before I uh, I, I read uh, and speak, um, we're just going to pray because I feel it's so important just to pray and ask for God's help, really. Father, we just want to thank you for your lovely son, the Lord Jesus. And, uh, you know, it's so precious this morning to just come here and remember him and appreciate really more what he's done for each one of us. You know, the sin and the mess in our lives, we realise that nobody else could have dealt with that. Nobody. Nothing we could do would make a difference. But we thank you for your son, who you sent to be the saviour of this world and our saviour. And uh, when we trust him, uh, he asks us to follow him. And uh, Father, when we do that, uh, you have so much to teach us, really. And uh, you never stop teaching us. And we make mistakes. And we fall. And uh, we get back up. And uh, hopefully we learn from those mistakes. But it's all part of uh, uh, you just moulding us and shaping us. Um, so, Father, we just pray that we will learn uh, to trust you more each day. And as we open your word now, Father, we just pray that you give us open hearts just willing to listen to what you have to say uh, and to respond uh, to what you have to say. We just ask this uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I say, Mark's Gospel, uh, we're going to look in uh, chapter 6 in a few minutes. Uh, but even if you go to chapter 1, you'll just see the amount of things that happen even in chapter 1. Uh, you get a real sense of how one thing leads on to another. Um, you know, uh, John the Baptist says that somebody greater than him is coming, somebody whose shoes he's not, uh, he's not even uh, worthy to untie. Uh, and then the Lord gets baptised, and then he calls some disciples uh, to follow him. Uh, he cleanses a leper, uh, he heals people. All this is in the first chapter. And uh, I'd encourage you to, to read again Mark's Gospel, and all the Gospels, really. Um, but for me, it's been a real help. Uh, it's just brought it home to me that if I want to truly follow the Lord, uh, then my, my life should maybe be a little bit like this, um, and uh, led by the Lord, really, uh, in the things that I do and the things that we, we should do. Um, so I don't know where... Uh, if, if any of you like uh, going out on boats on the water or anything like that, uh, I, I like going out on water. I, I love the water. Uh, when we've been away in the Lake District with uh, Renewal, um, I, 
uh, I'm one of the mad ones who goes for a swim in the lake. Uh, I just love water. I love being around it. And, uh, you know, the Lord uh, spent a lot of his time uh, around the water. Uh, and in Mark's Gospel, uh, Jesus spends a lot of time either on the Sea of Galilee or by it. Um, uh, yeah, in, uh, in chapter 1, uh, he starts, he calls fishermen to follow him. He calls fishermen to follow him. Uh, and then in chapter 2, he teaches by the sea. So he goes by the sea and he teaches. Uh, and chapter 3, he withdraws to the sea uh, and has a boat prepared for him because these crowds of people coming to listen. Uh, chapter 4, he's teaching by the sea and he teaches in parables. And then later in chapter 4, they cross to the uh, other side of the sea and they face a storm. Jesus falls asleep in the boat. You may have, uh, have heard this well known really. Uh, falls asleep in the boat. Uh, and then he gets up and he rebukes the wind and the waves uh, and he says, peace be still and he calms it. And in all these things, the disciples are watching on and, and learning things. When he did that, the disciples were fearful. Uh, they were frightened. And you know, for us, in our lives, sometimes we can be fearful. Um, maybe that's for me, because I'm not trusting God enough. Uh, that's often when I fear, and because I'm not trusting God. And in chapter 5, uh, again, they arrive on the other side of the lake, and the Lord meets a demon-possessed man, uh, and then uh, he, he puts the demons into these pigs and, and uh, thousands of those drown in the sea again so a lot of this is happening around this area around Galilee, around the sea and then again in chapter 5 they cross over again to the other side uh, and they try to get away in chapter 6 on a boat just to get some time uh, quiet just to rest really uh, and then in chapter 6, uh, later on, uh, we see uh, that the Lord uh, goes across again by boat and feeds 5,000 people. Uh, and then finally, at the end of, of chapter 6, uh, we, we hear the well-known uh, passage where the Lord uh, walks on the water. Uh, and that's what I really want to look at today, uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and the Lord uh, just walking uh, on the water just see what we can uh, maybe get from that. Just simple thoughts really on it. Um, so uh, Mark chapter 6 uh, and verse 39. Mark 6 and verse 39. Uh, sorry, Mark 6 verse 30. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest for a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in a boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. And when their day was now far spent, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass so they sat down in ranks, in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish 
he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up the twelve baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about five thousand men. Immediately, and this happens a lot in, in Mark's Gospel, immediately, straight away, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away, and when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marvelled. For they had not understood about the lows, because their heart uh, was hardened. So I want to think probably mainly on, on the, uh, the little bit towards the end where the Lord walks on the water. But the two things are linked really, uh, so that's why I've read them both. Um, you know, uh, so often wherever the Lord went, crowds followed him because uh, they wanted to hear what he had to say because um, they realised I guess they w- there was power in his words uh, and what he had to say uh, and uh, you know we read here that uh, the Lord said uh, to his disciples come uh, come aside come away from everything to a deserted place and rest a while he, he was trying to get them away uh, to have a rest uh, and obviously again they'd, they'd not eaten uh, and uh, they didn't even have time to eat, it says. There was no time. Uh, and yet, you know, uh, typical of the Lord, really, and, and his life and the way it was, uh, even in going away on that boat, trying to go somewhere quiet, uh, he wasn't even safe in that. People followed him uh, uh, around the shore, uh, and, and they met him uh, on the other side. Uh, and... Uh, because they wanted to hear what he had to say. And, uh, you know, I love what it says, uh, the Lord's response, um, because it says that he was moved with compassion for them. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And uh, that's the challenge to me, really, because so often uh, when I want a rest <laughs> and when I want to uh, stop for a bit, uh, uh, maybe the phone rings or something happens, and uh, I maybe have to go and do something, uh, and yet maybe a lot of the time I, I do go and do what I have to do. Uh, maybe sometimes I don't, but I know in my heart often I'm not right in doing that. And uh, only I know that, and God knows that. Uh, and, and in your lives, only really you and God know where you're at and how you respond to what He has to say. Uh, and yet here's the Lord. He was tired. You know, the Lord came here as a man, didn't he? And uh, he, he, he lived as a man. He was God's son, yes. Um, but he lived as a man. Uh, and he got tired too. Uh, we read about that when uh, he was asleep on a boat and a storm came. Uh, he was asleep, I guess, because he was tired. Uh, and yet he got up and he calmed that storm. But he would have been tired. And he could have easily thought, oh, you know what, we've come away to just get away from all these people. We need a rest. Uh, me and my disciples need, need a rest. Uh, and yet, you know, he saw the people and he was moved with compassion. And that's a challenge to me. Because so often, even in the things I do, am I really moved with compassion for, for people, really? Uh, do, do I uh, grudgingly, maybe at times, do things uh, uh, because I'm tired and I think I want to rest. Well, you know, God doesn't really want it that way. 
you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is our example, isn't he? Uh, he should be our example. Uh, we look at him. Uh, so I, I learn a lot from that, really, the Lord's response to this. Uh, when he was tired, when he was hungry, uh, when he really needed a rest, he saw the people and he was moved with compassion. And, uh, you know, if you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ as his disciples did, uh, then, as I said earlier, uh, your life will be disrupted. My life uh, will be disrupted. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, um, understand that, really, and, and be open to that, uh, and be willing, really, and it's about being willing uh, to, to let God have, have our lives if, if we choose him to follow him, really. Um, so he was moved with compassion, uh, and he wanted to feed these people because he knew they were hungry too. Uh, and uh, the disciples had a similar to reaction to, I'm sure, what I would have, or maybe you would have too. Uh, they thought, how are we going to possibly do this? Uh, you're asking an impossible thing there. You're asking us to do this. How are we going to do it? You know, we think about this as being an amazing miracle, and it was that the Lord fed 5,000 men and probably women and children, a lot more than 5,000 probably, uh, we think of that as being the main part of this miracle. But you know, in the middle of all this, the Lord is wanting to show his disciples something. And uh, maybe this is the most important thing about it today for us, really. Um, he, he wants to really show them that they need to trust him with maybe the little that they have. Uh, and that can be hard, you know. So often uh, I think, well, Lord, I can't do this. Uh, maybe what you're asking me to do, I just don't have it in me. I, I'm not capable. I don't have what what, what I need, really. Uh, and uh, maybe the disciples were thinking this right now. They're thinking, you know what, we, we've only got uh, these loaves and fishes and it's not much. Um, it wasn't much. Um, but for God, it was enough. For the Lord, it was enough. And I guess we we can remember that in our lives uh, that we may not think uh, we have a great deal uh, to offer God but God says if we're willing to come with what we have uh, and let God use it uh, then he will uh, and he does here uh, with these disciples and, and yet uh, even this wasn't really, they weren't really going to fully grasp uh, what he was trying to say um, so that was a challenge, you know, and, and I thought of uh, even uh, a great man in the Old Testament, Moses. Um, if we read in Exodus 4, verse 10, this is what it says uh, about Moses uh, when God asked him uh, to do something. Uh, it says, Exodus 4, 10 says, Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither before nor since have you spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. So here's Moses, a man, a great man, we know of the Bible who we often think about and talk about, uh, who God used. Uh, and yet he thought, you know what? I, I don't know what to say to people. I get tongue-tied. I haven't got the words. I'm not eloquent. I, I can't speak right, really. Uh, and yet God just reminds him who, who made him, really, who, who gave him the ability to speak uh, and, and goes on to say, look, I'll give you the words, really. I'll help you. Uh, so Moses struggle with this really too and I guess maybe uh, we all do we, we don't feel we're up to what God asks of us and you know what in truth in our own strength we're not are we we can do nothing in our own strength uh, and yet the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and that's that's a wonderful verse really um, because you know in our own strength we can do nothing and I so often uh, I'm confronted with my own weaknesses and I battle with them you see Moses here he, he was battling with them and you know what even when God said all that he said you know I can't do it 
and God gave him a spokesperson, Aaron, who, who, who Moses was going to give God's word to to speak. Uh, and yet, you know, God, if Moses had took him up on that, God would have used Moses' voice in a more powerful way, probably. And there's a lesson in that, you know. Um, you know, when these loaves and fishes came about, it, it wasn't the disciples' loaves and fishes. And they got them from a young lad. Uh, and uh, the point being, Moses, too, uh, still, when God spoke to him like this, but, you know, I still can't do this. Uh, and, you know, God, if, if we, when he, when he shows us and, and he shows us he wants to use us, if, if we're not willing to do that or not fully committed to that or fully willing, then he'll, he'll still do it, but he may use someone else and maybe you won't get uh, the blessing and the growth that God wants to give you through that. You know, Moses... It, God used Aaron with Moses uh, and uh, maybe with his uh, disciples he used loaves from someone else, fishes from someone else and yet you know what God wants? He just wants to trust us, trust him and, and take him at his word and you know for these disciples here uh, having to face this feeding all these people he, he just wanted them to trust him and take him at his word really uh, and believe uh, that he could do with a little, he could do a lot. Uh, uh, I met a, an elderly lady the other week, a, a lovely Christian lady, and uh, she 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 had some really good one-liners, uh, and and she said to me that uh, um, we do what we can, uh, and then God does what we can't, and I like that really. <laughs> uh, we do what we can. Uh, but God does what we can't. You know, we do, or we should do, what God asks of us. And then God does the rest. You know, it's nothing of us uh, when God does something. It's amazing that he's, he wants to use us in some little way. Um, but it's God who really does the work. You know, the Lord just asked the disciples if they had any food. Uh, and then he did the rest, really. Uh, and I love the way he did it. There was an order about it. He put them into groups. Uh, he knew what he was going to do. Uh, and he ordered all this. Uh, and he gave out these loaves and fishes and it went to everyone. And there was uh, all these baskets left. Twelve baskets. Uh, how significant is that? That there were twelve baskets. They all had one each, those disciples. Uh, and uh, you'd think, looking down at that, they'd think, well, look at what God has done. Look at what the Lord has done. Uh, he... he, he he does exceedingly abundantly above what we can ask or think, doesn't he, God? And he did it here. Uh, and abundance, they even had some left over. And yet, you know what? They still uh, didn't really uh, learn learn a lesson. Uh, it was going to be what happened next, really, that maybe would uh, uh, teach them. Uh, so uh, I think you said to finish about quarter past, Wes, but we were running a bit behind time, were we? Or? Half past. Half past, right. That's good. So I'll try not to go. Right, I'll, I'll try not to go beyond that because I do tend to waffle on a bit. As my dad is always telling me you waffle on too much, uh, and he's not here to tell me to shut up today. So, if it yeah, <laughs> if it gets to half past, then you've had enough. Just say right, stop. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, uh, so th this is the main bit of what I wanted to look at really, uh, because they've just seen this amazing miracle uh, from very little. God has done a great thing. Uh, and yet now uh, they're back on the water again. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, a chunk of the Lord's disciples were fishermen who'd been called to follow the Lord Jesus. And uh, I guess maybe their boats were being used and they were willing to, to let that happen. Uh, so I was thinking about this, that, that these guys uh, uh, were fishermen, so they'd have seen a lot. And yet, it seems when the Lord's with them, uh, things happen that they've never really seen before. <laughs> uh, they get into storms the like that they've never seen. Uh, you know, these guys would see lots of storms. But when they were with the Lord, they'd seen the biggest storms they'd ever seen, really. And, and uh, they, they were fearful in that, really. It 
take a lot to, I guess, make them uh, to make them frightened, make them worry, uh, and yet uh, it just makes you think that maybe again the Lord was just gradually shaping and moulding them and, and teaching them things that they needed to see. And here again we get this um, when uh, they're on the, the sea again. Uh, they're in the boat. Uh, the Lord's gone uh, to a mountain to pray and that's interesting to see again uh, because you know the Lord always find, found time to get alone uh, with God and pray. Even amongst all this seeming uh, busyness and chaotic uh, life there was, uh, he, he knew it was crucially important for him to spend time with his father, with God. And, you know, in our lives as believers, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, you need to make that time. The Lord had to make the time because he, he could hardly find it. He hardly had time to eat or stop. Uh, even when he tried to get away, people followed him. Uh, we, we read in other parts of Mark's Gospel where he got up early in the morning, uh, basically just really to get alone. And you know, that's a challenge to me. We, we I, and this is something throughout my Christian life has been a real challenge. How much time do I make, do I actually make an effort how much time do I make an effort to set aside to be alone with God? And how serious am I about that? You know, often when I think I'm alone with God, I've got my phone turned on and it's a couple of feet away. And somebody pointed this out to me the other day, that, uh, and it was a good point, that even if you put your phone on the other side of the room, that's still in your head. You're thinking, oh, I wonder what's happening on that phone. And it's a distraction, isn't it? You know, there's the, the, so many things in our lives that distract us and it seems to be getting worse by the year, doesn't it? Uh, and uh, maybe the world's changed a lot since these days. You know, the Lord, he, there's one occasion where it says the night before he, he was late uh, in somebody's house uh, and uh, there were people clamoring at the door uh, and he'd healed someone. And then the next morning, he was up early before it even got light, he said. That was how extreme he had to go just to get alone with God. Uh, and our world's obviously changed. Now we have so many distractions. And, and this was a challenge to me that, do I turn my phone off? When this is just my own personal thought. I'm not really truly alone with God if my phone's on. Uh, and I'm just trying to get some time with God. Uh, and that's a challenge to me and there's other things that can maybe distract us uh, if we're serious about spending time alone with God we, we need to uh, really desire that really uh, plan that really and make sure that it happens and that nothing stops it obviously at times things are, happen out of our control like the people following the Lord round the lake that day. Uh, and yet we need to do our best to get our time alone with God. Uh, I wasn't planning to say that, but it just sometimes God lays it on you at the time. Uh, so how serious are we about that? How serious am I? Maybe I should stick my phone on aircraft mode uh, a bit more often uh, when I'm just alone with, with the Lord, uh, with God. And so there's a challenge and, and the perfect example is the Lord Jesus who, who made time. He made this time, even when it was difficult. So he's praying uh, and then he looks out uh, across the lake uh, and he can see, he can see the disciples straining. And uh, you can read about uh, when the Lord walks on the water. You can read it in Matthew, Mark uh, and John. Uh, only Matthew records Peter walking on the water. Uh, and yet this Mark's account is slightly different. Uh, you know, when we think of the Lord walking on the water, the main thing that normally seems to come out of it is the fact that Peter gets out of the boat and, and walks with him. And it is that well-known uh, line that's often delivered in situations just like this, uh, which I've probably delivered myself sometimes, uh, that we need to get out of the boat, uh, which is true, we do. 
we need to get out of our comfort zone uh, and trust the Lord. The Lord had called uh, Peter towards him uh, and he got out of the boat uh, and he went to him. But he took his eyes off him, didn't he? And he started to sink. You know, we don't need to just listen uh, to God. We need to keep our eyes on the Lord, uh, fixed on him. But, you know, uh, in, in this Mark's account of it and John's, it's a little different. Uh, we don't really hear about uh, Peter so much. Um, but there was a, nif a different angle which uh, really looking at this came to me really um, we think about getting out the boat but in, in Mark's account here uh, we see that what happens is the Lord gets into the boat and uh, that's really interesting uh, maybe we'll just come to that uh, in a minute um, so the Lord has spent time praying and then he looks out uh, and he sees them straining uh, and uh, he can see the wind's strong and, and they're struggling a bit. Um, he says they've gone out into the middle of the lake. John's Gospel says three or four miles, just to give an idea. Um, but they've gone out to the middle of the lake and the Lord could see uh, them straining. And uh, the thing that stands out to me about this little portion, it's in Matthew, Mark and John. And they're slightly different, all the accounts. But the one thing that is the same is the words of the Lord. And the Lord says to them when he walks out on that water and they see him and they think, well, what is this? They even think maybe it's a ghost. That's how frightened they are. Uh, because this would have been something surreal, really. They've never seen this before. Uh, you can understand them thinking that. Uh, but in each of the accounts, in Matthew, Mark and John, uh, the words of the Lord are the same. He says, it is I, do not be afraid. Uh, so you know what, those disciples, they may have remembered different things, because these are eyewitnesses' accounts, the things they saw. Uh, they may have remembered different aspects of this, but this stuck in all their minds. It is I, do not be afraid. Those are lovely words, aren't they? They are lovely words, especially in the situation they were in, when they were afraid. You know, so often I'm afraid. I'll be honest. So often I'm afraid. Maybe you are at times too. You know, God doesn't want us to be afraid. He doesn't really want us to live like that. And we can take these words. Look it. It is I, it's me. Don't be afraid. You know, in any situation, we can take that. And we can think, you know, God is, God is with me. Why am I afraid? He's in control. He's in control. And I think that's what the Lord was just trying to show these disciples. Look, I'm in control. In your everyday lives, in the things you're doing, the things we're doing together, I'm in control. Lovely words. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Uh, it's me. It's the Lord. I'm in control. And then it says, he gets into the boat. I think in John it says they, they welcome him into the boat. And uh, this is a thought I had really that, you know, uh, we think of Peter getting out of the boat and we do need to get out our comfort zone but we also need to let the Lord in into the things we're doing uh, the things we have the things God's given us really uh, we need to let God into those things we need to let him into our boat basically in, into our lives uh, we need to let him uh, have the control and we need to trust him more and that's a lovely song we sung uh, about trusting uh, we need to trust the Lord uh, more I do uh, and we don't need to be afraid uh, we need to uh, let him in really uh, so often uh, 
I'll be honest, I, 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 I think about letting the Lord into certain things, but I'm frightened about what might happen if I do. I'm just being honest about that. Maybe you feel the same. We're frightened because we think, like Moses, like Moses thought, I can't speak. God's asking me to do this and I can't do it. Well, you know, as I started off by saying, really, talking about the, uh, the way the Lord was so busy and uh, the things he meant to do were often so disrupted things changed um, if we really want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ then we need to be ready for what comes with that really and there's a challenge uh, we're not to be afraid <laughs> you know when you let God have his way in your life when you let him into the boat <laughs> when you really let him into your life you know when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ we, we let the Lord into our lives, don't we? Let him, we, we have him in our hearts, really. And the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. But then we go on from there, you know. And we need to let God into every corner of our lives. And this is a real challenge for me, because I stand up here, really, as a bit of a hypocrite. Because I haven't really yet fully done that. But this is a challenge. You know, the Lord says... Take up your cross and follow me. Uh, you know, there's a cost. There's a cost. There's a cost to trusting the Lord Jesus in the first place. But then there's a cost in our lives, and it will cost us things. We need to be, I need to be uh, willing, really, and not be afraid to just trust the Lord. You know, these disciples had seen an amazing miracle. They'd seen the Lord take uh, these five loaves uh, two fishes and, and multiply them and feed everyone and yet at the end of the little section we've read uh, verse 52 says they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened and maybe that's what it's all about the hardness of, of hearts really you know in the middle of all that the Lord was moved with compassion for the people. He, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. His heart wasn't hardened to those people, was it? Despite his circumstances, his tiredness, everything that we, he was being asked to do, uh, he, he loved those people. And yet these disciples, they didn't understand what had gone on really. They saw an amazing miracle but they didn't fully get what the Lord was trying to show them. And they'd not understood. It said when all this had happened, uh, they'd been on the sea and they'd seen the Lord walk towards them and he got in that boat with them. It says they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure. They couldn't measure how amazed they were really and they marveled at it. They thought, this is marvellous. That's a lovely word, isn't it? Marvellous. We don't use it much, but it's an amazing word. <laughs> they marvelled at it. It was something that was marvellous to them. Uh, and I guess the Lord had brought them to this point where it started uh, to come together. And maybe now, uh, it says they had not understood about the lows. Before they'd not understood, maybe they did now. Maybe they realised that, you know, there was no need to be afraid. That the Lord was there. And he just wanted them to trust him. Now, you know, I wouldn't criticise any of those disciples or any of the people who saw this. Because, you know, in my life so often God does things and I see him do it and I think, wow, that's amazing. God's just done that. It was nothing about me I, could, I couldn't have done that myself God's just done it and he does things that are beyond you really uh, and yet you know what I still don't get it <laughs> because next time something comes along I, I fail to really trust him and 
this is the challenge, isn't it, maybe for us all? How much do we trust God? Are we willing to let him really come into our lives and be a part of it in every corner of it, really, to get into our boat, really, with us? And that's a challenge that came out of this for me. And also for me that, you know, I shouldn't be afraid in doing that shouldn't be frightened thinking oh no what's good going to make me do you know whatever God asks you to do if you respond he'll equip you to do that and you know what you, you'll you'll see that God's done that because these disciples they knew they just had a little bit and he used it and he multiplied it and you could see that God So maybe this is the key. Whatever God chooses to do for us in a little way, it all really comes back to bringing glory to God. And you know, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what we should want. That's what I should want. It's what it should be all about. Nothing of me, but all of God. Glory should be given to God because it's God who does these things and in this what we've read today uh, I would say uh, all the glory went to the Lord Jesus Christ it was him who was magnified it was God who was magnified through these things that he did uh, and you know what he just simply asked these disciples to trust him in it all not be afraid uh, but to trust and, uh, he asked the same of me and I guess he asked the same of you as well, just to trust him let him into the boat and let him be a part of our lives really, um, so I'm just going to pray I've gone well over half past so.